from this time on, we will learn about the second book, which is entitled The Forgotten Encounter or The, Co or the Covenant of the Torch in English. And our title tonight is To Win in Our Wilderness Journey, Life at Church. So why is the Exodus and Wilderness Journey important to us today? Let us learn about this tonight. We will know that it shows the course we must take to have true faith. So tonight, may we be able to encapsulate this faith that the Bible shows us that we must have that we must have today. So here, to learn how we can have this faith, we have to learn that first, we must get out of Egypt. Then we must cross the Red Sea and then go into the wilderness journey and then after this, cross the Jordan River and then enter into Canaan. So Egypt, crossing the Jordan River and entering into Canaan, these are all important aspects that we are learning as we go to church in our days. First, Egypt symbolizes the fallen world. People who have not met the Lord, they are living in this fallen world. If we look at Revelations 11.8, it speaks of two witnesses. And they live in a great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. And this is where our Lord was crucified. In fact, the place where Jesus was nailed to the cross was Golgotha, and that was in front of Jerusalem. So Revelations 11.8 is speaking of the spiritual Egypt and the spiritual Sodom that symbolizes the entire fallen world. In other words, spiritually, Jesus died in the fallen world of Egypt and Sodom. And these two places symbolizes the entire fallen world. So remember, when we speak about Egypt and Sodom, we're talking about the entire fallen world. And this is where Jesus was crucified spiritually. And then after leaving Egypt and crossing the Red Sea, they entered into the wilderness journey, which is our life in church. Acts 7, 38 says, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness. And so this is talking about what Deacon Stevens said about the wilderness. He said the wilderness was a church. And he specifically says it was a church in the wilderness. So we have to take notice of this. So now, as we live, what is the church? Spiritually, it is the wilderness. So we are seeking worldly food in the wilderness church. And this is stressful. Why? Because the food of the world is not in the wilderness. What do you receive at church? You only receive manna, the heavenly food. But the important thing to know is that the spiritual manna has the word, and within the word is also the physical food that you need. So the church has everything in it. 
on the outside, it seems like it doesn't have any physical possessions, worldly possessions, but because the church has the word, you have everything. Now, Canaan. The whole purpose of the wilderness journey was to enter Canaan, which is heaven. Psalm 106, 24 through 26. If you read here, it says that they despised the pleasant land. They despised it. And why? Because they were speaking of this pleasant land as Canaan. And they didn't know the significance of Canaan. So that's why they despised the pleasant land. In other words, this Canaan, which is a pleasant land, it was to be a land of joy. And it was to be, it was to be paradise, which foreshadows heaven. So Nakto is pleasant land and also parad paradise. In 2 Corinthians 12, 4, Paul confesses that he was caught up into paradise, which is also Nakto. And this is heaven. So Canaan symbolizes heaven, the pleasant land, paradise. So if you look at hymn number 291, it says, In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on the beautiful shore. And this is a hymnal that we sing. So this is speaking about the land of Canaan, which flows with milk and honey. And it also speaks of paradise and heaven. And also in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 10, it tells of Paul's conclusion of the wilderness journey. And what is this conclusion of the wilderness journey? It is found in 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Let's read it together. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says that the wilderness journey is for us. It's an example and an instruction for us to follow. So today, in terms of our faith, we must understand the significance of the wilderness journey as the church. And also, the Apostle Paul also says this in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Let's read it together. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. So here is the conclusion of the wilderness journey. So those who think that they were doing well, did they all enter into paradise, Canaan? We know that the first generation in the wilderness after the exodus, what happened? Of course, they thought that they would enter Canaan. This is the first generation's thinking. But they grumbled and complained. And as they were walking in the wilderness journey, thinking that they would enter Canaan, they all died in the wilderness. And this is the same now. We all came out of the fallen world, Egypt, and now we're in church believing growing our faith, so we all think we're going to make it to heaven. Yet, because of pride, we too grumble and we complain. And we even sin more than people of the world. We become more greedier than worldly people. But we think we're living in the church, so we think naturally we'll enter the kingdom of heaven. But as we begin to walk, we unfortunately fall. So what are the major points we should know about the wilderness journey? In this walk, 
we must know that as we walk out of the world, Egypt, and try to go into Canaan, heaven, there were two bodies of water that the Israelites had to cross. So they were traveling through three different major passages, but they had to cross two major bodies of water. And the Israelites, the bodies of water that they crossed, it represents two baptisms and it represents two new births. So as we live in the church, we must receive these two baptisms and two new births to enter the spiritual Canaan. So the first body of water, what was it? When they left Egypt, going into the wilderness, they crossed the Red Sea. So God, he separated this water and they walked on dry land. And this, this symbolizes water baptism the saints must receive. So this is the beginning of a new birth. So as they entered into the wilderness, they were baptized first with water. And this is just like us today. As we go to church, we are baptized by water and we confess that we believe in Jesus Christ. This is a new birth for us. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1 through 2, it speaks of the baptism. Let's read it. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So he clearly says in 1 Corinthians that they crossed the sea, and this represented baptism that Moses led as they Cross the Red Sea. So we must receive this baptism of water as well. So what is the second body of water that they crossed? It is the Jordan River. So they crossed the Jordan River before entering Canaan, remember? And this is the second baptism that we must undergo, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit and consummation of a new birth. So we have to receive this baptism of the Holy Spirit to completely be a new person and be able to enter heaven. So this last body of water of that we cross, Jordan River, what is Jordan River? mean it means to go down or to be lowered so to receive this baptism of the holy spirit and in order to enter into heaven and to be consummated as a new person we must be humble we must go down in front of god we must confess we are sinners go down on our knees confess our sins Completely, be completely humble. And then this is the way we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. James 4, 6 says the following. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So those who receive the word and go to church, they must also be those who are humble and not proud. So what grace do you receive? You receive the grace of being able to be a new person, a person who crosses the Jordan River because you are humble. Because you have lowered yourself, you can receive the grace of God and enter the kingdom of God. So, as we cross the two bodies of water, 
we must know it is the baptism of water and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So it is not enough just to cross the Red Sea. And it's not enough to just cross the Jordan River. Because Jesus says, unless we are born of water and the Spirit, we cannot enter God's kingdom. It says this in John 3, 5. So in other words, you cannot just enter heaven through the Holy Spirit baptism. You must also receive the baptism of water in order to enter heaven. You must lower yourself. You must confess your sinner. And you must truly receive God's spirit within you so that his spirit will lead you, cleanse you. And at that time, you will truly become a new consummated person that can enter heaven. So then, what is the difference between crossing the Red Sea and crossing the Jordan River? There is a difference in these two crossings. So in today's terms, the baptism of water and the baptism of the Holy Spirit there is a difference in these two baptisms and how it was done. First difference is the difference in time. When did they cross the Red Sea? At the beginning of the wilderness journey. And this happened at the third campsite before Migdal. So this is crossing into the beginning of a religious life. So as we receive the baptism of water, we began our new life of church, our religious life of faith. And when did they cross the Jordan River? They crossed at the end of the wilderness journey. They crossed at the 41st campsite at the plains of Moab. And this is crossing at the end of our religious life. This crossing of the Jordan shows what it should be like at the end of our church life. We must be able to cross this river and enter into heaven. We must be able to enter with our best faith, receiving that holy baptism. So these are the two differences in time. And what is the second difference? There was a difference in leaders. Who was the leader in these two different crossings? At the, Red, at the time of the Red Sea, Moses was the leader. He stretched out his staff and divided the water. So this represents a passive faith that we live in church where we follow our leader, our religious leader. So when we think of the church, we don't really know. So we, we become evangelized and then we listen to the pastor and we think, okay, that's all I have to do. Just listen to the pastor and follow. That is the basic first beginning of church life. But at the time of the Jordan River, who was the leader? It was Joshua. But not only Joshua, but it was the priests who held on to the Ark of the Covenant and parted the water. So they were the leaders. And these priests, they possessed an active faith who were leaders of the word. So at this time, we must all have an active faith. Who are these leaders? There are also leaders at church. There are pastors and evangelists, but they can't 
be our leader all the time, we must become leaders too. We must finally be awakened by the word and be able to act with faith. And what is the third difference? There's difference in beliefs. At the Red Sea, after Moses parted the waters, they crossed that Red Sea after seeing exposed dry land. So the Red Sea, what does this teach you? It is a faith that only believes by seeing. So at this time, they only believe because of what they saw. So in front of their eyes, whatever they saw made them believe in God. But at the time of the crossing of the Jordan River, what happened? The water did not stop flowing, but when the priests put their feet in the water, the water stopped flowing, revealing the dry ground. So these people, the priests, they had a faith that believed. They had a faith that didn't have to see. And this is a faith that believed without seeing. So even though they didn't experience it, they didn't see it. Because they believed in the word, they followed. And because of this belief, they had a mature faith that made them act. Why? Because the word told them to act, so they obeyed it and they produced fruit. This is a mature faith. God, in the beginning, when we first come to church, the, he, God shows us and makes him experience him and we say, oh, God is alive. And so this is the starting of our faith. It's just like the Red Sea. And a lot of experiences are felt because we are just beginning to realize who God is. So this is the spiritual beginning of the Red Sea. God splits the water. You see dry ground. You see miracles in your life. And you begin to believe in God. But after that... You just hear the word, you just see the word, and you just believe that way. This is the faith of having the Jordan River type of faith that rises. We must have this type of faith in order to go to heaven. So in the wilderness journey, there was a turning point. And that was at Sinai. And what did they receive? The Ten Commandments. At, the, at Mount Sinai, they received the Ten Commandments. And they didn't see many more miracles anymore. After this, they received the Ten Commandments and the Word. And in order to go to the Jordan River and cross the Canaan, how many survived? None of the first generation, many died because they couldn't follow just the word. But those who can, can cross the Jordan and enter Canaan. And the fourth difference, there's a difference in God's targeted people. During the crossing of the Red Sea, everyone was able to cross and make the exodus. What about the Jordan River? The first generation all died, and only Joshua and Caleb, and the second generation, they were the ones that crossed. So here, Moses couldn't even enter, and he didn't even cross the Jordan River. He died. So at the time of the Red Sea, just like today, all saints of this earth, they're targeted by God, they all cross into church. But right before they enter heaven, right before this Jordan River of faith, there is a separation and only those with faith like Joshua and Caleb could enter and cross the Jordan River. 
This is the difference between the start of church and the ending of church. So now, how were the Israelites like at the Exodus? What were they like at the time of the Exodus? Let us learn this. So they display the type of faith that believers must have as they leave the ways of this world and enter into a life of the church. So they display the type of faith believers must have as they leave the world and enter the church. So we already enter the church. We're living the life of the church. So we're holding on to the image of those people who were in the wilderness journey. And they're different images of these people. The first is the image of an army of soldiers. So as we begin our life of church, what image do we have? We have the image of soldiers. And what type of soldiers? Army soldiers. If you don't have this type of mentality, then you cannot survive in the church. Why? Because God is making us into soldiers of Christ. Exodus 12, 40 through 41, read it together. This is the image. Now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years on that very same day, it came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It says the armies. This is God's army. So are they just talking about men? No, they're talking about everybody. Approximately 2 million people Men, women, children were all part of this army of God. They were all the people who exodus Egypt. So the people here, the elderses, the elders, all of you are being called as God's soldiers, especially elders and elderses. You are the warrior prayer you are warriors who must pray. So 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 through 4 says, We suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. So we must be a good soldier of Christ Jesus, and we must suffer with him. So what is the wilderness like? So in Egypt, everything was so comfortable. But in the wilderness, there was nothing. So it's, it was nothing but suffering. So when, when you enter church life, it may become a time of suffering. The world was much easier because at church, you have to evangelize, you have to devote your time, your money, you have to clean. So you have to act like a soldier in order to survive in the church. Verse 4 says, no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life. And why? So that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. So we who are in the church, we cannot go back into worldly affairs. Why? Because God called us and we must please him as a soldier who does not go back into the world. So, because God called us, because we have thrown off Egypt, the world, and have entered the wilderness, which is the church, we are now his soldiers who are to give glory to God. So some people think like this. Oh, in this world, I suffered so much. Now that I'm in the church working for God, God, now my suffering is gone and I will have peace and comfort from now on. And they come to church thinking like this because they don't know the Bible well. They are mistaken. God calls us to church for him to fight the spiritual wars. 
you, we think, oh, when we go to church, everything will be well. I will live a good life. But those people, they all fall and because they get tested. So soldiers in the army, there's one way for them to be victorious in war. And that that is, they must know who the enemy is. So a soldier must have a clear understanding of their enemy so they can win the war. If you shoot your allies, you will lose the war. So who should we not fight against? We should not fight against our own church members. We should not fight against our own family, our husband, our wives, our sisters, brothers, children, parents, our neighbors, our members of the same faith and church. Ephesians 6, 12 tells us this. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So our war, the people we fight, we should be fighting Satan alone, not others. So the book of Revelations, there is a word that is repeated in Revelations, and that is overcomes. In Revelations 2, 7, 11, 17, 26, 3, verse 5, verse 12, and 21, 7. It says overcome seven times. It means to win. So saints, we must overcome. We must fight and win. And what does it mean? It means we have to fight them, doesn't it? So the book of Revelation refers to those who are saved in the last days as they fight and overcome because they are soldiers. So at this time, as we think about church and how we, we should live in the church, we must live as soldiers and we must definitely Fight against the world and not each other. I bless us upon you in the name of the Lord. And secondly, how were the Israelites like at the time of the exodus? What was their image? They had the image of a missionary. So as we are called to the church, as a soldier, we must also be as missionaries. So the Bible says it is the image of one whose loin is girded. So this is the tightening of a belt around our waist. So the Jewish people, how do they dress? They had a one piece, right? Like a dress. So when they worked, it was so uncomfortable so they had to wear a belt and tie their one piece to their body so they can work hard. So when they girded their loins, it meant that they were going to work. So the Israelites, when they did work, they always talked about girding their loins. And it says this in Exodus twelve eleven. It says, now you shall eat it in this manner with your loins girded. And what is this talking about? This is talking about the Exodus and they had to eat the Passover meal before they did this, right? So when we think about the church, believe that you have been called to do the work of God. And we must be able to gird our loins to do this work. So God, he gives you this mission and you must be able to do this work so you can be victorious in church. In Luke 12, 35 to 36, it talks about the second coming Lord. It says, let your loins be girded about and lamps burning and ye like men who wait their own load, 
whenever he may leave the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. So this is talking about us getting ready for the second coming Lord by girding our loins here as well. So we started the work at church, this Evergreen Hill Church. We have started with faith. So for the church, we must tighten our belt around our waist. And this is the image of one who works. If you receive grace and you receive the word, then here we know, must know the work we must do. We must find it. It is the work of prayer. And it also the work of devotion through your talents. And it is the work of worship. It is the work of praise. What you can do, find it. And for the church, do it as God calls you to do this work. So this is the conclusion of our message today. As we are called in the wilderness now, the church, we must know that God, Jesus, is our commander-in-chief. So we have to get ready to fight. And secondly, We will be victorious through our leader, Jesus Christ. So who was the leader of the church? It's not the pastor. It's Jesus Christ. So don't have any burden. Yes, we are called to church and we are called to fight, but don't worry, your leader is Jesus Christ. So the first coming Lord was the leader of the army in the Bible, and we are victorious. Please believe in this. Jesus never lost. If you follow Jesus, you will always be victorious. And the Bible tells that the first coming Lord is the leader of the army in John 16.33. If we look here at John 16.33, it says, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. This means Jesus in this world, he already fought and he already won. So don't be afraid as you are also in his army. Just follow Jesus and when you fight in this world, you will follow and win, just like Jesus. Jesus already won, so just follow him. And the second coming Lord is also the leader of the army. This is recorded in Revelations 19.11. So the second coming Lord, it says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat upon it, it's called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. So at this time, the followers of the second coming Lord also fight together as soldiers. So we must become this army for him who fight and win. For who? The second coming Lord. And we are the ones who are his soldiers who fight for him, and we will fight with him in the end. Revelations 19.14, it says, And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. So there, is an, there are armies in heaven. Are they not angels? You might think that, but it says clothed in fine linen. So that means they are those who are cleansed of their sins, who believe in Christ. And Revelation 19.8 says, For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So these armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, they are the fine linen of the righteous acts of the saints. That's us. So as we fight the spiritual fight, we too must follow the second coming Lord and follow him in this war. So do not worry, just follow and you will win. 
So what is important to know is that we must be the saints with righteous acts. That means we must stop in our acts and our words of being sinful. We must be at attention. We must only follow the word of God. Those who cannot stand the tribulations of the world, they must be those who overcome through righteousness and they will be victorious. And the spiritual soldier, when they see injustice done, they cannot stand it and they stop it. They do and say the correct thing. This is what a soldier does. And the soldier that is victorious, they're the ones who follow Christ. And then they are given a reward. And the apostle Paul confesses this in his final confession in 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 through 8. Paul gives his final confession in 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. This is his last word in the Bible. So in church, this must be our last confession too. Let us read it with faith. Ready, begin. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This is Paul's confession. So this Those who have kept the faith finished the course. They will be awarded not only to him, but to all that love Jesus. So this reward will not only be given to him, but to all that are looking forward to that day. So Paul, he doesn't only talk about himself, but he's talking about us too, you too. Be like him, and in the end, receive your reward. In the end, he confesses this, and then he becomes a martyr. So as we gaze upon our heavenly reward, may we also fight this good fight as a faithful soldier of Christ for the remaining three days of this week. Fight with faith and win. I bless this upon you in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Dear loving Father God, we give you thanks. Because of us, you have taken us out of this fallen world of Egypt and you have brought us across the river, across the sea, and you have allowed us to come into your church and now you take care of us and we thank you for this. May we be those who live as your soldiers, as your army, and as your soldiers. May we be those who protect the church and become humble and obedient and follow you as we cross this Red Sea and cross over the Jordan River and enter into the land of Canaan, the kingdom of heaven. May we be victorious like this. And from tomorrow, as we live in this world and fight the fight, may you give victory to those who love you. And in these remaining three days of the week, may we be able to be victorious over these problems of the world. And may we meet together again on Lord's Day. We thank you and we pray in the loving name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us give glory to God.